The scripture reading this morning is from Psalms 145, verses 8 and 9. It reads, The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. Good morning, everyone. It's a privilege to be here this morning. I know there's a lot of uh, excitement in the air as we start the new school year. More nervousness on my part, but it's all good. Um, thank you, Jared, for that special music. Give me Jesus. Amen. One of my favorite hymns of all time. Based on recent events, we need more of Jesus. Amen. I believe so. Thank you to our young people who have participated in our, uh, our song service this morning. I believe our church is in good hands. Amen. This morning, um, I won't keep you long, but I, I'm going to share some things that are deep and personal, and I hope that you can bear with me as I'm going to share a part of my life as we talk about uh, compassion this morning. Can you pray with me as before we begin? Father in heaven, we thank you for the Sabbath. We thank you for the rest that you have provided for us. Be with my words and give me comfort and wisdom in Christ's name. Amen. So a couple years ago, I'm ashamed to admit this, but I had an incident as I was driving to Walmart, and uh, I'm, here I am listening to some music, and uh, I'm driving along, and I'm going to use this to illustrate because I'm kind of a visual person. Uh, these are my sons. Okay, fine, they're mine. But, uh, so I'm driving along, and uh, I want you to imagine for a moment that uh, you're driving along you know, the road, and uh, you're about to cross an intersection. Okay, this is you. And uh, as I was driving along, there was another car that was on the left-hand uh, lane about to make a left-hand turn, okay? So get this picture in your mind. I'm driving along. As I was about to cross the intersection, right? Light was still green. I checked it, made sure it's safe. As I was about to cross the intersection, the guy who was on the left-hand turn lane, I'm not sure now. Keep in mind, for those of you that drive or took driver's ed, all right, when is it okay to make a left-hand turn? when there's, the, assuming the light is green, that uh, the, there's no oncoming traffic, right? So apparently this guy probably didn't get the memo or he failed driver's ed, I don't know, okay? But he decides, just as I'm about to cross the intersection, that he is going to make a U-turn into my lane, right? Dangerous maneuver, yes, I know, right? So, now, keep in mind, as about, I'm cr crossing the intersection, and I didn't have to really slam on my brakes, but I had to press my brakes fairly hard, right? To the point where, yes, I actually had to stop because I was about to hit this guy. Now, part of my brain, the part that probably wasn't working, said, you know what, this guy needs to know that he did a dangerous maneuver and he, I need to express my belief in uh, letting him know that he did a dangerous maneuver. And so I didn't, you know, my brain wasn't working at the time, it was more filled with anger, and so I didn't just, you know, gently honk my horn. You know, just kind of honk and just like, hey, I'm here, you know, what's up? Um, I did one of these, Burr! I'm kind of ashamed to admit that because uh, the guy, you know, if that were me and, and uh, I did that dangerous maneuver, I would probably do the universal hand gesture of, uh, you know, hey, my bad, you know, you can't hear me. But, you know, you kind of raise your hand to acknowledge, yeah, yeah, you know, my fault kind of thing, right? That's what I would do, all right? But this guy decides that he is going to stop right as he was about to make a U-turn into my lane. I'm stopped right behind him, completely stopped, right in the middle of the intersection. The light turns red, right? So imagine this picture in your mind. He stopped, I'm stopped, and he begins to open his door and look at me. He's halfway out of his car. He's looking at me, right? And in my mind, the part of my brain that wasn't working begins to size this guy up, right? He's about gray hair, so it's like, okay, he looks kind of older, all right? The part of my brain that wasn't working was like, all right, if you want to, you know, you want to do something, let's bring it, old man, let's go, <laughs> right? And I actually saw my hand reach for the door handle. I don't know what I was going to do, but I saw my hand, I was like, and then the part of my brain that started to work finally said, um, you know, he may be an old man, but he may be Chuck Norris old, you know. Um, he might know karate or coming up. He might be the old guy I saw in American Ninja Warrior. I don't know, all right. 
So I start my hand, right? And the guy turns around and he's looking at me. Now the whole altercation probably took about 20 seconds, right? But it felt like an eternity. He looks at me and he gives me the, the universal hand gesture of disapproval. Right? He begins to wave the admonishing finger. You know, your parents, you know, the I told you so kind of, you know, finger. Except it wasn't this finger, it was, it was his pinky, right? Uh, so he, he uh, gives me a lesson on bird watching, and uh, I'm looking at this guy like, really? Are you kidding me? Like, you're stopped, I'm stopped. Everybody else is probably wondering what is going on. You know, nobody's moved. Um, and I raise my arms like, what are you doing, dude? You know? So we're both stopped there, and he's just looking at me, you know, waving, you know. Um, and uh, I decide, okay, there's a left-hand lane. I'm just going to go turn my wheel, and I'm going to, whoop, you know, go on the left lane. I'm just going to pass this guy because, you know, I don't want any, you know, thing to do with him, right? Um, but as I'm about to turn, I turn my car. This guy turns around quickly, moves his car into my lane, Right and blocks my way of you know trying to make you know into this left hand uh, left hand lane. So he's try he's he's angled this way and I can't get in uh, to to this lane right here. Right now I just raise my hand like I give up. Right I don't know what you're doing. He begins to look at me and he's still you know waving his finger at me. Right um, I reverse my car and I was like I got to get out of here. Right reverse my car go into the right lane. I just peel off. Right and. As I get to Walmart, I park my car, and you know, you kind of calm down after a little bit, and the Lord began to speak to me, right? You know how God kind of does that to you in a still, small voice as you're in your car? And the uh, Lord began to speak to me and, and asked me a question, uh, Oliver, hi. She's part of the story. Um, <laughs> God began to speak to me and said, Oliver, was that the best impression that you gave this gentleman of myself? Now, believe it or not, I'm ashamed to admit this, I actually began to have an argument with God, <laughs> right? God asked me a question. God said, you know, was that the best representative of my character? I said, well, God, he started. He's the one that, you know, made a left-hand turn. I was the one who's innocent here. And God began to speak to me again. He said, Oliver, quit acting like a five-year-old and answer the question, Right? No, God, was not the best representation of your character. And in my mind, I began to ask myself several questions. What was this guy's name? Why didn't he see me? Why did he decide to make a dangerous maneuver? Was he in a hurry? Was he out to meet somebody? Was he distracted? Was he just having a bad day? And in my mind, I actually convinced myself, this guy needs compassion, right? He didn't see me. He might have been having a bad day. I don't know. But in my heart, I actually tried to convince myself, and I ended up doing so, that I actually felt sorry for this guy, okay? The Lord began to speak to me that day and said, and came into this verse. If we can put the verse up on the screen. Um, is our verse for uh, this morning. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, amen, rich in love, the Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. Now, the word compassion is actually a Latin word and actually means to suffer with, right? To suffer with somebody. It's almost like empathy, right? Now, why would God have compassion on all that he has made? That includes every one of us here, right? Why would God have compassion on every single one of us if we didn't need it, right? The reason why God has compassion on us is because he knows that every single one of us in this world needs compassion, amen, right? We all have bad days. We all have things that are happening to us. Everybody needs compassion. If you agree, say amen, all right? We sing song, everybody needs compassion, right? We sing that song, all right? We all agree, everybody needs compassion. I want to challenge you this morning. If it makes you feel a little uncomfortable, well, you know, I'll let the Holy Spirit speak to you, right? Um, if we go to the next slide, there's a show out there that I used to watch, um, Jimmy Kimmel, and he has this segment called Celebrities Read Mean Tweets, right? And I used to watch this thing, and I used to laugh at all the different comments, and I've blocked this one out for good reason, right? Um, and I used to laugh at the kind of things that people would say to all these celebrities, 
And in my mind, I kind of would justify, you know, why I was laughing at this. And I was like, you know, these guys are celebrities. You know, they're rich and famous. You know, they, they could deal with, you know, all the critique and criticism of people saying mean and hurtful things to them. But then I began to realize in my mind, I was like, wait a second. Since when did making fun of somebody else become entertainment? Right? Do you ever wonder that? When did making fun of somebody else, you know, become our own personal enjoyment or our own personal entertainment? And it's kind of like, well, I get that these people are rich and famous. It kind of comes with a package, you know, um, <laughs> celebrities, you know, you have to deal with this kind of thing. But you ever stop and wonder and said, just because these guys are rich and famous, does that make them somehow immune to hurtful and nasty things? Does being rich and famous all of a sudden give you special powers that you're able to resist all these nasty comments that are said about you? Does being rich and famous all of a sudden become, make you, you know, somehow invincible to, you know, um, every harsh word or tweet that comes your way? We have to often realize that, yes, even these people, they have people, they have feelings just like you and I do. They may be well-known, they may be wealthy, but they have feelings too. How do I know that God has compassion on these people? Because the Bible says in Mark chapter 10 that a rich young ruler came to Jesus and said, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Right? And Jesus starts saying all these commandments, and he tells Jesus, well, I've done all these things, right? And the very next verse, the Bible says that Jesus looked at this guy. He beheld him, and the Bible says that God, Jesus, had compassion on this guy. Why? Because in his mind, I'm rich. I'm probably famous. Everybody knows me. I have no need of God. I'm just here probably looking for approval. I have no need of God. I just want this guy to say like, hey, you're good. You're awesome, right? You're rich and famous. I have no need for God. God looked past his situation. The fact that he probably didn't care, maybe he did, I don't know. And God had compassion, yes, on the rich folk. All right? You see, Oftentimes, you know, we look at people in their, in their situation, and we often think that these people are just as human as we are, All right? Now, I must say this. Having compassion on somebody, does that excuse somebody's behavior? Like, no, no. okay, I hope not, right? Um, having compassion on somebody, I would hope that uh, if some guy were to commit a crime, that, you know, justice would be served, and we wouldn't just feel 100% compassion and just say, you know, let, you know, 100% um, forgiveness. I would hope there'd be some kind of justice, you know, available, because that's, you know, the way it works, right? Um, I would hope if a kid turns in something late, you know, five times in one week, right? I would have compassion, right? But there also needs to be justice, amen? Right? <laughs> so, we move on to the next slide um, here. I want you to imagine something for a second, all right? Take a look, take a look at the picture on the top left right there, and, uh, and the picture on the top, uh, sorry, the bottom right. And uh, if you were walking down the streets in an urban area, right, and you saw the guy on the top left, he's walking along, he looks kind of, you know, elderly, and uh, he's walking, 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 you're, walk you're seeing this, and uh, he all of a sudden slows down, stumbles, and he falls to the ground. Now, National Geographic did this study, right? How long, based on this guy's appearance, how long do you think it was before somebody actually came and said, hey, are you okay? You're all right, man? You're good? How long it was, okay? Less than three seconds. Somebody came and, uh, you know, um, helped him out. They did this over and over and over again. Less than three seconds, some guy, you know, or, you know, woman dressed in a certain way, all of a sudden stumbled and fell, and less than three seconds, people came out and helped. They had compassion on this individual, right? Because that's not normal, right? Um, versus the guy on the bottom right. Now, you see this same situation, right? You're walking down the street, and uh, he's holding something in his hand, and he slows down, and he collapses on the ground. According to this study, and they did this over and over again, how long was it before somebody actually showed compassion on this guy and asked if he was okay. How long do you think it was? It was about 17 minutes on average. About 17 minutes before somebody actually walked by and said, hey, you okay, man? Right? 
Now, somewhere deep down inside, now, the surprising thing is not, you know, the fact that we make snap judgments about people's appearance and things like that. That's not the surprising thing. The surprising thing is, whether or not we like to admit it or not, we often think that some people are more deserving of compassion than others, right? We don't like to admit that. Because as much as we like to think that everybody needs and deserves compassion, we often think to ourselves, but we don't want to admit it, that some people are more deserving of it than other people, all right? Let's flip the script real quick, uh, get to the next slide. Um, scenario here, all right? So you see the guy on the top left, and uh, you see him on the street, and he's holding a sign that says, uh, homeless, need help, all right? Holding a sign, homeless, need help. Versus the guy on the bottom right has the same sign, homeless, need help. Which one are people more likely to lend a helping hand? The guy in the top left or the guy on the bottom right? If you're anything like me, I would probably say the bottom guy on the bottom right would probably be more deserving of compassion than the guy on the top left, right? Um, but here's the thing. Do we know the situation of both these individuals? We don't know, you know? Whether or not, based on somebody's appearance, you know, someone needs compassion, we often uh, kind of make snap judgments about people, not only based on their appearance, but we often don't like to admit that some people are more deserving of compassion than other people, all right? I was in the Paradise Valley Mall, PV Mall, and uh, we let our kids play on the playgrounds. Remember that, right? Um, we let our kids play on the playground, and uh, my son, you know, he, just, he has lots of energy, and he's still trying to figure out some social cues, right? He's running around, and uh, he's, you know, going crazy, and uh, he's having a good time, you know, playing down the slides and whatnot. He uh, wanted to make friends with, you know, two girls who were in that playground, and he's listening right now. <laughs> he wanted to make friends with them, and he just starts going up to them and starts laughing with them, and uh, one of the girls... One of the girls grabs her friend by the hand and says, come on, let's go. Now, my son's four years old. He's still trying to pick up on, you know, social cues, things like that. He thinks he's just having a good time. Like, ha, ha, ha. He goes up to them again and starts playing, you know, trying to play and go on a slide and whatnot, right? He's trying to play around. Till finally, the girl that took the uh, other one by the hand, she points to him. He's listening intently. <laughs> she points to him and says, no, you can't play with us. Now, as a father, how do you navigate that sort of thing, right? Um, there was a, actually another parent that was there, um, and she actually saw the whole thing and turned and looked at me and just gave me this look of pity, like, I am so sorry, you know, for the behavior of this child. I don't know where the parent is. Um, so I call my son over. I was like, let's go, you know, and he's like, why? And I was like, you know, some people just, you know, have a hard time playing nice, and that's all, right? So he reluctantly comes along, and as I'm putting his shoes back on, he asked me a question that, like, really broke my heart. He was like, Daddy, how come the other kids don't want to play with me? Right? Now, as a parent, how do you navigate that sort of thing? Like, you know, what do you, what do you say to that, Right? You say, come on, the world's a cold, world's a cold, cold cruel place. Suck it up, Junior. Right? Or we just help kids sort of, you know, and allow them to navigate that, yeah, some kids just haven't learned how to be compassionate to others. Right? Fred Rogers, if you go to the next slide, I'm sure many of you guys are familiar um, with uh, uh, his work. I just thought uh, these verses were uh, fitting uh, for, for this topic. Um, Isaiah 49, verse 10, They will neither hunger nor thirst, nor will the desert heat or the sun beat down on them. Fitting for Arizona, right? Um, he who has compassion on them, God's people, will guide them and lead them beside springs of uh, water. Psalm 116, verse 5, The Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. Amen. God is compassion. Next slide, Fred, Fred Rogers, um, many of you are familiar with his work. Um, now, you're talking about a show that has impacted millions of people, right? Um, <laughs> how many of you guys watched Mr. Rogers as a kid, all right? Um, amen, I did too, right? 
Um, one of my favorite shows uh, growing up, even though the puppets kind of freaked me out just a little bit. Um, but he was one of the first ones to uh, pioneer the idea that kids really can't, kids as up to five years old really can't tell the difference between the world of make-believe and real life, right? And so we'll talk about a show where some guy would come in and sing songs, and he's going to talk like this, and we're going to take off my shoes, and then we're going to go into a factory where they make crayons and balloons and pencils, and I'm going to sing songs to them about sharing and about love and about compassion. I mean, talk about a show where you take everything that's good about a show today, you know, violence, suspense, you know, all that kind of stuff. You take all that stuff that makes a good show today, you throw that out the window, and that's what this show really was all about, right? Um, Fred Rogers, I admire his work so much because while he got into television because he hated television, and so he wanted to use the same medium that he hated to draw kids. And he said this quote, and I'll never forget it. As he was trying to convince people to put on his show, he said, you know, watching two grown men settle their differences is more powerful. That's more powerful than any gun, any bomb, any suspense scene that you could see on TV. What has more of an impact on young children today is actually watching two people reconcile their differences, and it starts with teaching our kids about compassion. In fact, there was another show that came around right around the same time. You guys remember Sesame Street? Right? Sesame Street was more of the academic you know, kind of thing. They taught the alphabet and numbers and, you know, all that kind of thing. Yeah, they weaved in a little emotional intelligence. But Fred Rogers was actually the first one to admit to people that it is not your intelligent quotient that makes a difference in later success. You could be the smartest person in the world and not achieve success. It is actually your emotional quotient, your EQ, that has the biggest difference in determining whether or not you will be successful in this life. Now, successful, not necessarily financial success, but, you know, in all ways of success, right? Now, I want you to uh, put this idea of compassion to the test. And I'm going to invite uh, Caleb. Can I, uh, he doesn't know I'm doing this. But uh, I want you to imagine for a moment that Caleb and I are in this uh, little uh, interaction here. And uh, you're going to a store. Uh, we'll call it, since it's Sabbath, we'll call it Jesus Juice, right? You're in the, and you're here, you're here for the first time. And I want you to order a, a medium green juice. All right? So you walk in. right? Hey, how's it going? How can I help you? Yes, you uh, may. Awesome. Is this your first time here? Yeah. Great. Um, you know what? Just for being a first-time customer, I'm going to upgrade you to the large. How about that? What? All right. Awesome, right? So you're told me 450. All right. Let me imagine he hands me 450. Now, the change that I give him, I don't give him. Now, he gives me a $5 bill, right? I give him back 1050, right? $10.50, right? Now, <laughs> Caleb looks at that, and I'm sure most of us, if that was probably your, inner, your, you know, your impression of this store, I would hope that most of us would probably feel compassion, you know, um, on this uh, poor cashier clerk who just gave, you know, me more change. And you would probably do the right thing, yes, okay, and give the person back, you know, the change, right, that they had overlooked. All right. Now, same scenario, but this is the altercation, or sorry, this is the interaction that you get, all right? Same thing I want you to order. What do you want, dude? Hold on one second. Hey, what's up, man? Oh, for real? I don't know. I'm just at work. Yeah, man. Let's go hang out tonight. Oh, yeah? That's cool, man. That's awesome. All right, man. I'm just, whatever. Some dudes, you know, want to help. All right. So I'll talk to you later, all right? So what do you want? The medium juice? It's a little too early to be drinking a lot of juice, isn't it? Don't you think? All right. Well, whatever, man. Four fifty. All right. Um, go ahead and have a seat. Now, if that was your thank you, Caleb. If that was your interaction, and I gave you back ten dollars and fifty cents, do we throw compassion out the window? If that was your interaction, ooh. 
right? Everybody needs compassion. Amen? All right? Regardless of our interaction with somebody, regardless of our, uh, uh, of our whatever happens with somebody, everybody deserves compassion. I kind of want to close uh, with, uh, with this story. Um, so I was in graduate school, and I was having a really bad week, right? I was the epitome of a poor, starving college student, right? Do you follow me? Um, I had still had loans from La Sierra University. I was attending Cal State Fullerton at the time. Um, and I racked up, my faults, by the way, I racked up um, about $60 in parking tickets, right? All because I didn't have enough money to afford the parking pass, which was like $500 at the time. You know, I thought I could save money by maybe, here's what I would do, all right? I would go to class, right? Park my car in the one hour zone, right? Class was two hours long and there was a 10 minute break in between. I would park my car in the one hour zone. It was free, right? Didn't pay for anything. During the 10 minute break, I would run literally a quarter of a mile, right? Run a quarter of a mile, take my car, all right, and I would park it in a different one hour spot zone, right? That's how desperate I was to try to save money. Needless to say, I was late three times in one week, all right, and I racked up $60 in parking, so which I had to pay, otherwise I couldn't attend class. That was, you know, the deal back then. Um, I had $4 by the time Thursday was around. $4 cash, right? I didn't have a job. No one would hire me. Um, here I am in grad school. I had a full night of studying going on. $4 to my name. I get out of class right at 7 o'clock, and I am starving, right? Really bad week. Wrapped up parking tickets, and here I go, right? I had $4 to my name, and I begin, all right, what's around me? Was, you know, I could you know, get some dinner. Hopefully, it'll fill me up and carry me through until Friday when I can go home and beg my parents to feed me, right? Um, so I park my car in front of a Jamba Juice, Okay, that was probably the best bang for my buck at the time, right? I couldn't even afford a value meal at McDonald's, you know, $4. And I'm scrounging around for some change, right? And lo and behold, deep in the recesses of, you know, the car seats, you know, um, I found 75 cents, right? I said, perfect, that's enough for a 24-ounce smoothie at Jamba Juice, right? I'm going to get one of these things, I'm going to down it, and I'm going to go home, and I'm going to study and, uh, you know, call it a night, all right? Keep in mind, I hadn't eaten any dinner, so I ordered a thing, put my cup in, and I'm driving back home, taking a few sips. I probably maybe get that much done with it by the time I get home. And I take this cup, part my car, take the cup out. I have it in my hand, right? Keep in mind, I haven't eaten any dinner. I put it on top of my car. I reach in to grab my backpack, and as I do so, the cup slides off the top of my car and splat all over the ground, right? At that moment, I begin to feel sorry for myself. You know, I'm angry and whatnot. Um, the cup is ruined. This is one of those cups. It's like a foam cup, and so the cup was just busted in half, right? The smoothie all over the ground. And in my anger and frustration, at the moment, I look at a scenario, I turn and I kick the cup, Right? Shame to admit that, but I kick the cup. It rolls onto a street where a car was just passing by. And the guy in the car stops the car, rolls down his window, and begins to berate me. He goes, what are you doing? And I said, sir, I have every intention of picking it up. I'm just angry. He's like, well, pick it up. And he said this to me. I'll never forget this. I tried to explain my situation, you know, I'm just angry, this was my dinner, and he wasn't having it. He said, you know what, it's punks like you who think they just kind of own the place and kind of leave their trash all over. He starts to just, you know, ridicule me, right? And he said, now pick it up or I'm calling the cops. No matter how hard I tried to explain my scenario, I was like, sir, I just parred my car, I'm trying to, in anger and frustration, I picked up the cup, right? Give this guy a dirty look, right? Let him know I'm upset. Throw it away in the trash. He drives off. All I ever wanted was for somebody to understand my situation. That's all. You know? 
And sometimes we look at people, sometimes we, meaning me, right? Sometimes I look at somebody, a little rough around the edges, has an attitude problem, maybe a drinking problem, maybe an addiction problem. And all of a sudden, I tend to throw compassion out the window because, yeah, you get what you deserve, man. Not realizing that there's probably a story behind the addiction, that there's probably a story behind the anger, that there's probably a story behind the situation that they're facing, and all I'm getting is the external you know, uh, reaction from this person. And all of a sudden, I just brush my hands and say, you know what, hey, see you later, pal. Now, being in that same situation, what that taught me was all I wanted was for him to understand what, what just happened. I just wanted a little bit of compassion, that's all. You know, understand my situation, you know, just a little bit. And as we go through, you know, our Christian experience, I've learned that some of the roughest people, you know, can be, you know, they're hidden gems inside these people. All right? Let me close with these quotes uh, up here. Um, we can get to the, to the last slide. There it is. I love this quote. Um, this is Fred Rogers. When I was a boy and I would see scary things in the news, my mother would say to me, look for the helpers. You will always find people who are helping. Amen? All of us at some time or other need help. Whether we're giving or receiving help, each one of us has something valuable to bring to this world. That's one of the things that connects us as neighbors in our own way. Each one of us is a giver and a receiver. I love this last one. I don't think anyone can grow unless he's loved exactly as he is now, appreciated for what he is rather than what he will be. Right? We start having compassion on people. And see them how they are now, not necessarily for, I'm here to change you. We let God do that work. Right? But just have compassion on what we see in the here and now. I believe that's what God has called each and every one of us to do. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for being full of compassion. I thank you, Lord, for having compassion on someone like myself, who probably doesn't deserve it. But nevertheless, you have shown me, in return, I want to show others the same compassion that you have given to me. So I pray, Lord, that each and every one of us will understand more about your character and follow you in all that we do. These things we ask in Christ's name. Amen.